why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to innocent people? Why do bad things happen to children? Well, why do bad things happen to helpless people? But you know, if I, if I really want to be honest with myself, I, I want to know why bad things happen to my people. Why do bad things happen to my spouse and my children, my parents, my friends, my family? But if I want to dig even a little bit further, what I, what I really want to know is why do bad things happen to me? And now, as we begin this teaching series that's going to last for us the next few weeks, it is simply titled, Why? I, I want to be completely honest up front. I have never known the pain and suffering that many of you listening right now know. I have never had to stand at a graveside to bury one of my own children. I have never known the abuse, pain, abandonment, or betrayal of a spouse. I have never known financial collapse, and I have never stood or sat in a doctor's office simply to have a doctor look me in the eye and say, there is a disease that now occupies this portion of your body, and we don't think you have very long to live. I have on way too many occasions, however, stood at the head of a graveside, I've been the one asked to pronounce words of comfort as a parent buried an infant, a toddler, or a teenager. And all the parents wanted to know was why. I have on way too many occasions had to sit in my office or in living rooms as one spouse confessed betrayal to another. I spend way too, too much time in hospital rooms and hospice rooms holding the hands of people as they breathe their last breath. And families cried out in agony, just tell us why. Why him? Why here? Why now? Why this? And I have held my wife's hand as she laid on an examination table. And the doctor said, you're losing this baby. And everything inside of me wanted to scream out, why? What, should she, what has she ever done to you? And I sat on an examination table in a doctor's room myself as the doctor walked through the door with the MRI results and said, Mr. Cox, I believe we now know the source of your pain. You have a brain malformation. And he continued to talk, and everything after that sounded like wah, 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 wah. And my wife had to explain to me what he said on the drive home. And how he said the only solution for my pain was a brain surgery. I dropped her off at the house, took about a 40-minute drive to a river where I knew there was a waterfall where I knew nobody else in the world could hear me and screamed at the top of my lungs, why? Why me? And I began to dig into God's word and try to find out for myself why bad things happen to me. And I can tell you after years of study and after personal experience that there are no religious cliches that we'll do in moments like this. And over the next few weeks as we dig into some of these hard questions, we are not going to offer you religious cliches. I will also tell you that there is no new truth to discover that God has made it abundantly clear in his word why. And what we want to see and discover together is a, is a principle, is a, is a pattern, is a, is a truth that if believed, can bring meaning to your meaninglessness. It can bring hope to your hopelessness. It can bring reason to your senselessness. It can bring purpose to your aimlessness. It can bring some relief to your bitterness. And we see this begin to unfold. We heard it in the words of Jesus as he taught, but we see it on the morning of the resurrection. Luke chapter 24, if you brought a Bible with you, if you're in one of our venues, you can pull out a Bible, you can pull out your smartphone or your tablet or your electronic mobile device, and you can find Luke chapter 24. And I want to begin to read in verse 13. And what I want to do 
as we begin to unveil this pattern is I want to just walk through this passage of Scripture. I want to read some. I'll ask some questions. I'll make some comments. And I want to ask you to engage because today and over the next few weeks, all I'm asking of you is to engage at an honest level, to engage with, with these questions that are bouncing around in your mind. But it starts with understanding the principle and it starts with understanding the pattern. And we see it on this Easter Sunday morning. Luke chapter 24, beginning to read in verse 13. Now that same day. Now please understand that this is Easter Sunday morning. That, that the women had showed up at the tomb and the tomb was empty. And they'd run back to tell the disciples. And the disciples didn't believe them. And the disciples ran ahead to see if he was in the tomb. And he wasn't there. And they were confused because they didn't see him with their eyes. And it's that same day. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem, and what I need you to see at this moment is the direction they're traveling. I don't know if they're traveling north, south, east, or west. There is archaeological debate if there was even really a city called Emmaus seven miles from Jerusalem. Oh, we've archaeologically, we found one about four and a half miles from Jerusalem, but was there one seven miles? We don't know. We can't find one, so I don't care if they're traveling north, south, east, or west. I don't even care that they're traveling to the road to Emmaus. What I want you to know is the direction they're headed is away away from Jerusalem, away from the empty tomb, away from the place where God has just done the miraculous, away from the place where God has just revealed himself with power like he's never revealed himself before. And these two are are moving away, moving to a place where they are more comfortable, a place where they are more content, and they are moving away. And some of you showed up today, and you're moving away. Now, Tim, how can you say that? I'm in church. Well, maybe you came here for one last hope, one last gas. Maybe you got drug here and promise of a really good meal afterwards. I don't know. Or a family portrait. But truth be told, as recently as last night, you were moving away. I have good news for you if you're here today moving away. Jesus has a way of showing up on our road when we're moving away and heading us off at the pass. Look what happens next. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. A couple of things I want you to see is that when you're headed the wrong direction, when you're headed away from the work of God in your life, when you're going to someplace comfortable and someplace where you can find, think you can find contentment, Jesus has a way of showing up. But I want to beg you, don't miss him. Because he can show up and you can miss him. He can be right there with you. He can be standing there beside you and you can miss him. Don't miss him today. When he shows up, he shows up with a purpose. And your questions don't make him quit on you. Your doubts don't make him run the other direction. And your rejection of him doesn't repulse him. He continues to show up and say, I want to walk with you right by your side. Even when you're headed the wrong direction. I don't know today if you're headed the wrong direction. But you know if you're headed away. Oh, you can put on the... You can put on the front and you can put on the facade, but truth be told, you're, you're moving away. If you're moving away today, don't miss him. Don't miss him. He's still on the road with you. They were kept from recognizing him, and he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And now this passage of Scripture starts to get funny. I hope you read the text, and I hope that you see there are laugh lines built in, and, and just it becomes humorous. And he says, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. Some of your texts even say, Jesus said to them, why do you look so sad? What I want you to know is when you're headed away, and you're sad, and you're discouraged, and you're depressed, and you're disappointed because, because things haven't turned out the way you thought they were going to turn out, Jesus sees your countenance, and he knows your sadness, and he wants to interact with it, and it doesn't turn him away. He wants you to be absolutely, completely honest with him, and they were sad sad and when we're sad and discouraged and depressed Jesus still shows up and one of them named Cleopas asked him are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened here in these days you see what they say to him don't you who are they talking to they're talking to the living holy God they don't recognize it but that is the person to whom whom they are speaking and you know what they say to him you're just a visitor You have no idea what's gone on in Jerusalem during these days. And in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our hurt, in the midst of our agony, when we cry out why, isn't that exactly what we say to God? God, why are you so distant in my life? Are you merely a visitor? We we believe that false theology that simply says God is watching us from a distance. 
When in reality, God is walking with us next to us side by side, carrying our burdens. And we, we treat him as if he's a visitor. And you don't understand what's going on in my life. You don't understand the pain. You don't understand the intensity. You don't understand what, what it is that I'm wrestling with. God, you don't understand. And it's ludicrous to say that to the living God. It was ludicrous for these two men to say that to Jesus. You don't understand what took place there in those days. When in reality, he is the only one who understood what took place that day. He was the one who hung on the cross. He was the one who was put in the tomb. He was the one on the inside when the tomb opened up. He was the one who walked out. He was the only one who understood. And God is the only one, my friend, who understands exactly what it is you're going through. Do not treat him as a visitor into your life. He understands exactly what you're walking through. And then it gets even funnier. Look what they do next. Jesus plays along. What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that, it was, that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all of these things took place. Do you see what these two people do? It ought to make you laugh at the top of your lungs. They begin to give the living God the holy and true God, a lecture in theology. It's all about Jesus. He's of Nazareth. He was a prophet. He was mighty in word and deed in front of God and all the people. We thought that we'd hoped that he was going to be the one who'd redeemed Israel. They give God himself a lecture in theology. And isn't that exactly what we do when we cry out why? God, why do Bad things happen to good people. God, if it were up to me, if I ran the universe, there would be no suffering. God, you don't have a clue what you're doing. Let me tell you how things ought to be. And they begin to give Jesus a lecture in theology. And it's humorous. And it's ludicrous. Because he alone is the one who knows exactly what to do. He's the, he alone is the one who is without equal, without peer. And he stands and he takes it. And he says, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Can I ask you to engage with me just a minute, fill in the blank? I had hoped that he was the one who was going to, how do you fill in the blank? I had hoped that he was the one who was going to not let my loved one die. I had hoped that he was the one who was going to restore my broken marriage. I had hoped that he was the one who was going to Bring me somebody to love. I'm single, and I have been faithful, and I have stayed pure, and I thought that he was going to bring me somebody to love and somebody to love me, and I am still single. I had thought that he was going to be the one who would heal my child. I thought that he was going, how do you feel in the blank, my friend? I hoped, I had thought it was going to be him who, and he hasn't done it the way you expected him to do it, and now you're ticked off at him. And you think all hope is gone. What did they say? What's more, it's been the third day. They understood the story, friends that he was supposed to rise on the third day. I'll talk to you about that in just a minute. But I just want to know, how do you feel in the blank? I'm asking you to be honest. You might not want anybody else to see your paper. You might not want anybody else to see your heart. But be absolutely brutally honest with God. God, I thought you were going to be the one who. And would you see with me, please, that they misunderstood just a little bit. We thought that he was going to be the one who would redeem Israel. What are they saying? We thought that he was going to be the political Messiah. We thought that he was going to come with swords and with power and rescue us and defeat Rome and give us Israel and the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem back. But that's not why he came. He came not to just be the redeemer of Israel. He came to be the savior of the world. You see, what happens is when God doesn't work according to our plan, we don't think he even has a plan. And I just want you to go back and revisit. What had you hoped that he was going to be the one to do and how do you feel about it now that he didn't do it that way? Next question for you. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. God does not run away from us when we ask our question why. He wants us to ask that question if it's the sincerity of our heart. He wants us to say, God, I thought you were going to be the one. I'd hoped you'd be the one to do this, but you didn't. But here's what I want to ask you, my friends. What evidence do you need? 
If you're asking with the honesty and the integrity of your heart the why question, what evidence do you need to accept God's answer? You want to know the evidence these people had? These people had the evidence of the written word of God. We knew what the prophets had to say about who Jesus was. They had the evidence of the living word of God, Jesus himself speaking the truth. As he said to them, they knew the story about the third day. As Jesus said, as it was with Jonah three days in the belly of the fish, so shall it be with me three days in the earth and I will rise from the dead. They knew the story. And they had the evidence of the written word. They had the evidence of the spoken word. They even had evidence of some witnesses. They were called women. They went to the tomb early that morning and came back and said, he's not there. And do you see what they said? They confused us. They didn't accept the witness of the women. You know why? Because women in that day and time weren't consider considered credible witnesses. Well, Jesus always thought they were, and Jesus treated them as credible witnesses, and Jesus cared for them. But in a, a society where in, legally they could not, women could not be uh, allowed to testify in court because they were considered unreliable, the men just simply wrote off the witness. And there are so many of you today that are writing off the witnesses of God that he has placed in your life. People, maybe it's your pastor. Oh, you're just a pastor. I've had people sit in my office. You're the preacher. You've got to say things those way, that way. Oh, you're just a Christian. You check your mind at the door. You can't engage in intellectual discussions. You're, you, you, just, you just exclude the witnesses based on the fact that you deem them unreliable. What evidence do you need this morning, my friend, that Jesus is who he said he was? What evidence do you need to believe the resurrection? They had the written word. They had the spoken word. They knew the story. They had witnesses. And then it says they went to the tomb and they saw it with their own eyes. And they saw an empty tomb, but him they did not see. Just give me one more piece of evidence. The tomb's empty just like you said it was going to be. Just give me one more thing. God, I'll believe if you do this. What's the if, my friend? What evidence do you need this morning that keeps you from believing? Look what Jesus responds. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are. Keep a hold of that word foolish. The opposite of foolish is wise. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He says, I know you're looking for more evidence. Why are you so slow to believe? Some of your translations don't read that way. Some of your translations include another word. Why are you so slow of heart to believe? In the Greek language, which the New Testament originally written in Greek, in the Greek language, the word heart is there. It's cardia. It's what we get cardiac, cardiologist, uh, from. It's, it's cardia. And Jesus says, why are you so slow of heart to believe? You see, my friends, if you're looking for more evidence, I just want to be up front with you. If you're looking for the answer to the why question, the answer to your why question is not going to become what you see. It's not an eye problem. It's not going to become what you hear. It's not an ear problem. It's a heart problem. Jesus says, why are you so slow of heart to believe? The scriptures say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him, you shall be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with the mouth that you confess and are saved. My friend, what do you believe in your heart? It's an issue of faith. No matter how much evidence is laid out before you, no matter how clearly and intellectually and logical the case can be made for you at some point in time, it is a decision of faith. It is a matter of belief. And I just want to ask you one more time, what evidence do you have to have before you will believe, and why are you so slow of heart to believe? What evidence do you need? And look what Jesus says, verse 26. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus just said, hey, this is the way it had to be. And, and you know that. You know the scriptures. You know the prophets. And you know what one of the prophets wrote? This is what one of the prophets wrote. His name was Isaiah. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. The New Testament writer writes it this way. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. God says, your sin deserves death and I offer you a substitute sufferer. And the only way for that to happen was for Jesus to suffer. And I wish there was another way. I wish that the Son of God didn't have to be beaten bloodied. I wish that the Son of God didn't have to be crucified. I don't understand it all. And Jesus simply says, didn't it have to happen this way? Is this how God ordained it? And I'm in no place to give God Almighty a theology lesson. And I want to know what evidence do you need to believe. Some of you here today have never accepted the fact that Jesus came to planet earth to be your substitute sufferer. He lived a life of perfection, died a death on a cross, and rose from the dead so that you might be saved. Your death 
requires separation from God for eternity. And Jesus took your place so that you might live. Have you ever said yes to Jesus? If not, what evidence, what more evidence do you need today before you will believe? Why are you so foolish and slow of heart to believe? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And that's, my friend, the sermon that I hope exists in the cloud when we get to heaven. It's the sermon that I hope, you know, Apple has figured out how we can download on my iPod. That's the one I want to understand. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. And some of us are like, watch, he's doing some kind of, you know, Jesus-like judo move that he's going to kind of juke them out and he's going to pretend like he's going to stop and go farther. Do not be surprised at this activity of Jesus. This is his pattern. You need to catch this today, friends. This is his pattern. Remember when he fed the 5,000. He fed the 5,000 and he put his disciples in a boat and he sent them to the other side of the lake. Jesus went up to a mountain top to pray by himself and he was alone. And when he got done praying, he looked down at the lake and there was a huge storm and the disciples were straining at the oar and they could not get to the other side. So Jesus walks down the mountain and he starts to walk on the water and he goes out to the boat. And you know what Mark's gospel says in Mark chapter 6? Jesus intended to pass them by. It is his pattern to keep on walking unless... Unless what? So they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. He is going to pass you by unless you cry out. Mark's gospel says of the disciples when they saw Jesus about ready to walk by, they cried out. We don't know what they cried out. We simply know that they cried out. And he stopped, got into the boat, raised his hand and said, peace be still and everything calmed down. These two guys, the Greek word used here, they urged him strongly, is a word that means to constrain. The picture here is if Jesus had not said yes to their words, they would have tied him up, put him in the chair, and sat him at their table. He wasn't going anywhere that night because they wanted to know more about what this man had to say. They were willing to constrain him. And here's what I want to remind you of, friends. If you do not cry out and ask Jesus to stay, he will keep on walking. If you do not invite him to stop, he will keep on going. And some of you already at this moment, God has spoken to you abundantly clear. And you know exactly what it is he expects of you. You know that you need to give your life to him and come to him for salvation. You know that you need to commit your life to his church and into service. You know exactly what it is God has called you to do. But my friend, if you do not respond, he will keep on walking. If you're here today and you're still not getting the answers to the why questions that you hoped for, I, I just want to beg you, if you're not ready to say yes to Jesus, I beg you, beg him to stay by. Beg him to walk with you. Do not allow him to continue on his journey because I promise you if you do not cry out and constrain him to stay, he will keep on moving. Don't let that happen to you. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their side. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while they talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures? And they got up at once and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those with them assembled together saying, it is true, he is risen. He is risen indeed and the Lord is risen and appeared to Simon. And the two told Two, two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Here's the pattern, friends. It's verse 30. He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it. He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it. Say it with me. He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it. He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it. And surely, my friends, this is what we see Jesus doing. Go back just three chapters to, uh, I, or two chapters to Luke chapter 22. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered his followers in an upper room. And after he had washed their feet and got back at the table, he sat at the head of the table and he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it. Go back to Luke chapter 9, the feeding of the 5,000. And watch what Jesus does as the little boy brings five loaves and two fishes. He, he takes it. He breaks it. He, he takes it. He blesses it. He breaks it. And he gives it. But surely, my friends, this is more than just a pattern of what Jesus Jesus does with a loaf of bread. It's more than how he handles a loaf of bread. Surely this is how Jesus interacts with our life. It is a pattern that we need to understand. And I would submit to you it is the pattern of scripture that starts in the beginning when he took man out of the dust of the ground and blessed him by breathing into him the breath of life. When he broke him with, when with one 
step of misobedience. He banished him from the garden, but before he took him out of the garden, he gave him new clothes that he could wear to protect him. It is the pattern of Scripture. I would submit to you it's the pattern of Scripture. It's the pattern of what God did with Abraham. When Abraham lived in this land, the land that people moved to and not the land that people moved from, God said to Abraham, get up and go from the land where you now live to the land where I will show you. And he took him and he blessed him and he said, you will be the father of many nations. And he broke him by not giving his wife Sarah and Abraham a baby. And then an angel came to Sarah and said, now months from now when I come back you're going to have a baby boy and she laughed but he actually had a boy and she named him Isaac because she laughed at God and he gave him the heir to the promise it's what he did with Isaac when he took him from his mother's womb when he blessed him and said you are the child of promise you are your father's heir and he broke him on an altar when his father was about ready to plunge a knife into his heart but he gave him over there in the thicket a substitute sacrifice a ram that took his place so he no longer had to die. It is the story of God. It is the pattern. It's what he did with Joseph. He took him from a pit that his brothers had put him in in order to cause him harm, and he blessed him in the house of Potiphar, and he broke him in the prison of Potiphar, and he gave him to Egypt to be the prince of Egypt. It's what he did with Moses. When he took him from the weeds, when he took him from the basket that that was floating on the water, And he blessed him in Pharaoh's house and he broke him in the desert and he gave him to the children of Israel to be the rescuer and deliverer because God had seen their misery, heard their cry, and he was concerned. It's what he did with Jesus. He took him from heaven where everything was rightfully his, where angels bowed down and worshipped him. And he sent him to earth. And he blessed him at his baptism when he said, You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. He broke him on the cross, and he gave him to you and I in an empty tomb with the resurrection on the third day, my friends. It is the pattern of Scripture, and we need to live in it. And you need to understand when you're asking the why question, what season, what pattern, what, what, what section, what stage you're in. So let's talk about them for just a minute. First of all, he took it. Most of us don't like to be taken anywhere. We don't understand a lot about the taking because most of the time when we're taking, what we know is only this. We used to be there and now we're here. We used to be there and now we're here. I I don't like to be here. I like to be there because there is familiar, here is unfamiliar. There is comfortable, here is uncomfortable. There is known, here is unknown. Oh, I don't like to be here. I don't like to be taken anywhere. And the question we ask in this phrase, the why question we ask very simply is this, God, why did you bring me here? It's the question that the children of Israel ask in the wilderness after God had led them out of the land of slavery. After, after God had brought them a rescuer and a deliverer, they were in the, in, the, in the desert and they simply said, we don't like it here. God, why did you bring us here? Did you bring us here to die? Let us go back there because at least there in slavery we can have fish and chips every day. We'd much rather live there in slavery than here in freedom. Be careful, my friends. God takes you from there to here for one reason, and it's the next stage, to bless you. God cannot bless you here until you move here. He has to take you here to bless you. Stage two is the blessing, and some of you are in this blessing stage, and God is blessing you abundantly. Every weekend, uh, about every weekend, as we end our gatherings, I stand up here and I pray a prayer over you and Uh, I take my hands and I put them in this little fashion like this and I forget that some of you haven't been around here very long and uh, just a couple of weeks ago I got an email from a from a, a new friend who said hey we're coming to church there and you do this at the end of every good why do you do that and I just want you to see I think he was afraid I was like Mr. Spock or something I'm not sure but but you see this it kind of forms a W can you kind of see the W and it's it's symbolic it represents the Hebrew letter Shin the Hebrew letter Shin which is the name of God, Shaddai, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And so as we, as we do this, as we pronounce the blessing and the prayer over you, it's may God Almighty rest on you. That's what I'm saying with my hands. But I, I say almost the same prayer every week. It's a blessing from the book of Numbers, chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God Almighty protect you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May, may God be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you wholeness, peace, shalom. I'm praying God's almighty to rest on you and give you his grace and his protection and his peace but we miss out have you ever noticed though that in this stage of life in this season of blessing there aren't very many why questions asked I don't have very many people come to my office and say Tim God's just pouring out his blessing over me and I just woke up today and I want to know why God gave me healthy children I want to know why God gave me that raise I want to know why God did this. Most people, we don't ask the why question in the stage of blessing. 
We think we earned it. We think we deserved it. We think it, it, it's of our own accord that we get God's blessing. And my friend, I want you to know that his blessing is by his grace too. And in this stage, you, you need to understand and be thankful. And so Jesus took it and he, he blessed it. And if you're in the stage of blessing, I just want to remind you what comes next. He broke it. Nobody likes to be broken. I'm just curious today, what is it that God is trying to break you of? Some arrogance? Some pride? Some eyes that don't recognize him? A pattern of sin? A, 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 an addiction? A habit? An ungracious spirit? What is it that God is trying to break you of this day? You see, none of us like to move into the stage of brokenness. One man once said, we need to understand that God cannot use a, a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. That brokenness is just part of the story. I want to know this morning, friend, I want you to be gut level honest with yourself and with me. What is it that has turned on the tap of your tears? What is it that keeps you up at night tossing and turning that you, that you just can't get over? Why, God, are you doing this to me? And it's bad that you can't sleep at night because this already occupies every waking moment of your existence. And it has got you so disgruntled and so depressed and so down that you cannot even dream or fathom or imagine that God has a good plan for you and you are just doubting. I just want to know, friends, what is it that is causing in the agony of your soul you to scream out, Why? Can you identify it? And what is God trying to break you of? Would you imagine with me for just a minute the creation story? In the beginning, God said, and it was so, and it was good. And everything God created was good. And the culminating act of his creation was a man and a woman. And he placed them in a garden of perfection. He said, everything here is available for you. Only do not take part of that tree. God always reserves a portion just for himself. And the enemy, the liar, the deceiver, the trickster came in and began to lie and said, God's just holding out on you. Go ahead and eat. If you eat, you'll just be like God. So, so go ahead. And our spiritual parents ate and they tasted the consequences. And we've tasted the consequences of their disobedience ever since. But here's what I want you to imagine with me. Imagine that first night after they've been banished from the Garden of Eden. They're used to sleeping in the comfort and the warm and the cool and, you know, everything's good. God comes down for a visit. They have a pleasant night's sleep. But now all of a sudden they've been banished from the Garden of Eden and they're out sleeping on the, on the, on the cold, hard ground. I don't think there's a whole lot of loving going on that night. I don't think there's a whole lot of cuddling. I'm pretty sure there was not a whole lot of talking. If there was any talking, it was talking at and not talking to. Why did you drag me into this, woman? Well, why did you throw me under the bus and tell God, well, it's the woman you gave me that made me do it. I'm pretty sure that there was just a whole lot of talking at, but I do think the unanswered question of the day of the night was very simply, why? Why did we listen to the snake? Why did we take that act of disobedience? Why didn't God intervene and stop us? Why doesn't God love us? Why did God put us out here? And God begins to speak. It's recorded for us in Genesis chapter 3. God speaks, and it's what's known as the first presentation of the gospel. The theological term is the proto-euangelion. Proto meaning first, like prototype, right, and evangelion being evangelism, the first presentation of evangelism, where in Genesis 3.15, God says this. He says, hey, there's going to be a, a serpent, and there's going to be an enemy, and there's going to be a liar, and there's going to be a deceiver, and all the time I've, I've put enmity between him and the woman's offspring. And he's going to be striking at their heel, and he's going to be causing suffering, and he's the ultimate source of suffering. But there's coming a time when there's going to be one who will come and crush his head under his heel, and it's a picture of Jesus. My friends, in that breaking... God's trying to do something. Did you remember with me as you celebrated Holy Week that even Jesus himself asked why? Matthew records it for us. Mark records it for us. They're the only two gospel writers that record it for us. That from the cross, Jesus screams out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which translated means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you left me on the cross? God, why have you turned your back on me? God, why? And I just want to know what it is that has you asking the question, why, this morning? And I want to know what evidence you need to accept the answer. It's beautiful to me that three days later, Jesus is no longer asking the question, why? He simply says to the men on the road, didn't the Messiah have to suffer? It's just the way it had to be. But in the moment, in the moment of breaking, we ask the question, why? And it's okay. Here's what I need to ask you this morning. In the taking, in the blessing, and in the breaking, where's the bread? 
He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. It's in his hands. Have you forgotten today, dear child of God, you're in his hands? The implication so many times of the question we ask why is that you're a visitor, you're not here, you don't care in the taking and the blessing and in the breaking. The, the loaf never leaves his hands. So now let's all stand and sing. He's got the whole world in his hand. No, we're not going to do that. My Easter gift to you is I won't sing that. But, but it's, the, it's the picture. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. When he takes, when he blesses, when he breaks, the loaf is in his hands. Have you forgotten today that you're in his hand? It's, it's why... The other gospel writers, Matthew doesn't record it for us, and Mark doesn't record it for us. They simply say, Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Luke and John record for us. You know what Jesus says next? Father, into your, who knows? Say it again. Hands. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus is like, yeah, well, why, why do I have to suffer? Oh, yeah, no big deal. I'm in your hands. Some of you today, need no more evidence you simply need to surrender to the love of his hands he took it he blessed it he broke it and he gave it when he gives we do what the two did notice what he did he gave it and when he gave them the bread it says he vanished he disappeared from their sight because he didn't want this to be eye business he didn't want this to be ear business this was heart heart business what do i believe about who god is and he didn't have to tell them what to do after he gave them the bread by the way i i skipped a part the last verse out of that passage that I just read says um, they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. I, I think that's where some of you need to understand you need to recognize God. You're not going to recognize him anyplace else except in the breaking. You're not going to come to the end of yourself. You're not going to surrender to his lordship. You're not going to do that except in the breaking. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. After he broke the bread and gave it to them, he vanished. He disappeared from their sight. They didn't need any instruction about what they were supposed to do. They got back up without finishing dinner and went the seven miles back to the city of Jerusalem. No longer were they moving away. They were moving back. My friends, that's called repentance. When you turn around and go the right direction. And some of you today simply need to repent. But they knew exactly what to do. They were now called to be a witness. They were now called to share. And they didn't have to be convinced and they didn't have to be persuaded. Over the next few weeks, as we ask some of these very hard why questions, at the end of every time, I'm going to ask you to make a move. And I'm asking you to make that move today. And it's very simply this move. To move from wise to wise. Jesus said, why are you so foolish? It's, why are you living an unwise life? Go ahead and ask the questions, but don't let the, don't let the answer keep you from living a wise life. And in the midst of asking the why question, there's always a wise action to follow. And Jesus says the wise action here very simply is to believe, to trust. He's God. He doesn't need a theology lesson. I believe that he's good, that he has my best interest at heart, and I will, I will trust him. Here's what I want to invite you to do. When you cannot trace his hand when he's not out there and you can't see exactly his handprint on everything and every little thing when you, when you cannot trace his hand will you trust the power of his hands to hold you to keep you Jesus John chapter 10 go read it sometime he says uh, I hold you in the palm of my hand and no one can snatch you out and more than that my father holds my hand in his hand and no one can snatch my hand or you out of his hand. Would you trust, when you can't trace his hand, would you trust the power of his hand? When you cannot trace the path of his feet, will you trust the beat of his heart? That he takes you to bless you, that he breaks you to give you everything that you need. And when you don't understand and nothing else makes sense, will you simply say, it had to be this way because you're God and I'm not. You're I am, which by definition means what? I am not. In a moment, we're going to invite you to this table. And you do not need to be a member of this community of faith. We're not trying to embarrass you or put you on the spot, but if you'd like to take the Lord's Supper today here in this place, there are elements at the front. You can come and take a piece of the bread, pick up the loaf. He's got you in his hands. Dip it in the blood, which reminds you of the sacrifice and how much he loved you. 
This is how much the Father loved you. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. If you don't want to come up front, if you're down on the bottom floor, there are elements back on this side of the room, back by the windows. There are elements back on this side of the room, back by the windows, and you're welcome to do that. If you're in the balcony, there are elements upstairs. You can just do this in the privacy of your heart. But what I'm begging you is very simply this, to understand that Jesus is walking with you. Do not allow this to be a ritual. Do not allow this to be just what we do because we come to church. Would you come and experience the love of a God who has you in his hands, whether he is taking you, blessing you, or breaking you. And I beg of you, don't let him keep on walking. For some of you, today is the moment of salvation. God is calling you to salvation through faith and trust in Jesus. For some of you, today is the day to say, yes, I will serve him in the church. For some of you, today is the day that says, God, I had hoped that you're going to be the one who did this and you didn't, but God, I'm just going to come back home. I'm no longer going to be moving away from you. I'm moving back closer. Almighty God, you have spoken with abundant clarity on this resurrection day as you did the first resurrection day. Oh, God, you play along with our games for for so long, and you allow us to treat you with with contempt and disdain and say that you're just a visitor and and you don't understand. But, God, each and every heart, each and every soul that's represented, uh, and here's the sound of my voice right now, God, is your child and you are intimately acquainted with all of their ways and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt you hold them in your hands God you are moving some you're taking them from from here to there and it's unfamiliar and it's uncomfortable and it's unpleasant and they want to go back but God would you allow them to understand you've taken them there to bless them and God some of us you're blessing in ways and we haven't even stopped to say thank you we take the bread and dip it in the cup today we say thank you God I don't understand why you blessed me with three healthy daughters Uh, God I I don't deserve it you blessed me with a spouse that's loved me unconditionally and never betrayed me there's nothing I've done to earn that and God you knew me intimately as you formed me in my mother's womb And that brain fat malformation, God, was not a mistake. And in the midst of that excruciating pain, you hold me in your hands. And I say thank you. Because I don't deserve anything but pain. But you offer me peace. God, for some today, we need to say yes to Jesus and the life that he came to give us by dying a death on the cross and rising from the dead. God, I pray for some that if they've never prayed this prayer before, they'd say something like this. God, I I beg you, don't walk past me. I don't even know what to say, God, but I cry out, come into my life, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Walk by my side. God, this is a hard issue for each and every one of us. So in this moment, at this time, may our hearts be quick to believe and quick to trust. God, continue to speak, continue to work, and may we be obedient. God, you take us to bless us. You break us to give us every good and perfect gift. May we receive that now through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For those of you that are worshiping online, our time with you now has come to an end. In just a moment, the screen is going to go uh, to information with my contact numbers and emails, and I would love to hear from you this week. If you said yes to Jesus, would you let me know? If there's some way that I can pray for you, would you let me know? God bless you as you go through this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.